92 million tons of textile waste are produced each year. So for every single second that passes in watching this video, the equivalent of one garbage truck of textiles is thrown into a landfill or incinerated. When an article of clothing is incinerated, it releases toxins and harmful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which contributes to global climate change. These textiles also leach harmful chemicals and dyes into the groundwater. More importantly, two-thirds of all textile fibers are synthetic, and these materials containing polyester can take upwards of 200 years to degrade naturally. Polyester is found in nearly 60% of all fabrics. Formerly known as polyethylene terephthalate, PET is a compound which is known for the effects it has on the environment during and after production. As consumers, what we fail to realize is that not only do the choices we make when purchasing have an impact on the environment, but what we do afterwards that truly matters. Even when we donate, sell, or gift our used clothing, it still ends up in developing countries where each piece of clothing continues to impact the global environment. Finding a solution is imperative, not only in improving our actions, but also in considering the impacts on people across the world from our simple choices of engaging in fast fashion. This is the issue that Fabrifuel solves. As a team of 24 passionate individuals, it is our primary focus to 1. Create a genetic system capable of completely digesting polyester and its byproducts. 2. Generate electricity as a result of this cellular metabolism. And 3. Prioritize stakeholder engagement in order to raise awareness of fast fashion and to help get people involved in a user-centered solution. We have designed a three-chambered system connected to a microbial fuel cell. The system utilizes three different bacteria in order to ensure that not only is PET degraded, but that each of its byproducts are also fully digested. The first chamber, our focus for this competition, will depolymerize PET into its byproducts, ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid. Then, the byproducts of the primary reaction will move via diffusion to the other chambers where they will be digested as noted on screen. For our first aim of digesting PET, we have prototyped our minimal viable product, including testing a plasmid containing the genes for a metase pedase chimera protein, MP12. In combination, these two proteins have shown higher PET and MHET turnout in comparison to the two individual proteins. Thus far, in the development of our proof of concept, we have obtained the plasmid for our chimeric protein from Dr. Greg Beckham. We then transformed this plasmid into DH5-alpha to optimize DNA replication and conducted maxi preps to replicate and purify the plasmid DNA. We also investigated a restricted digestion with two endonucleases, PST1 and XBA1, which will theoretically cut our samples into three and two pieces, respectively. When we conducted a gel electrophoresis, we were able to see bands corresponding to these values, confirming that our plasmid was successfully transformed with the aim to produce a recombinant MP12 chimera. We made and transformed chemically competent BL21 to optimize it for plasmid expression. We then expressed the protein using IPTG-induced expression, following the established protocol from Dr. Beckham. We then began the process of purifying our protein by adapting Dr. Beckham's protocol according to available materials and equipment in our lab. In this process, we were unable to express large amounts of the plasmid due to the large size of 7,997 base pairs. As a result, we were working with very small amounts of expressed protein. We learned that we had to adjust our protocol to increase the concentration of lysozyme to ensure complete cellular lysis. Despite these challenges, we were able to successfully purify our protein using a nickel column and confirmed this through identifying the expected bands at SDS page. We used the XPC modeling software to identify key information about the specific molecular properties such as the molecular weight and extinction coefficient. We confirmed the molecular weight through the protein gel. Based upon these results, we have now scaled the production from 300 milliliters of starting bacterial growth to 2 liters in a recent production run at Fred Sense's facility. During this time, we were grateful to receive feedback and mentorship from Dr. Robert Mail on how we can optimize our protein expression and purification. We have also focused on the development of further versions of our product. 
of a plasmid containing MP12 and a secretion system in order to ultimately create a system which does not require constant external protein purification. This plasmid includes the same MP12 plasmid from Dr. Beckham. Second, we chose to use the PM3 variant of the PAL-B secretion signal peptide, as studies have demonstrated its enhanced degradation and secretion efficiency. Third, we used the T7 promoter system, which is induced by IPTG because of its high transcription rate. Throughout this prototyping, we received feedback from various mentors, including doctors Laura Keffer Wilkes, Robert Mayle, and Emily Hicks. Most importantly, Dr. Mayle played a significant role in advising us on plasma design and project implementation. In the past year, we have gone from the development of an idea to the creation and in-house production of an enzymatic system that can now be used for the degradation of textile waste. This proof of concept is not in the process of being tested. Furthermore, we have developed the theoretical model of our plasmid containing a secretion system, which will be used in our final system. In addition to the larger protein purification underway, our future steps are noted on screen. In the near future, we will be focusing on developing a protocol for quantifying enzymatic efficiency in PET degradation. After better understanding the MP12 chimera, we will begin the transition to our second generation system, including our plasmid, which is designed for enhanced enzymatic activity in addition to the incorporation of a secretion system, which will allow for simpler production at scale. In parallel to our work on MP12, we have also been working on our second objective of generating electricity from the breakdown of these waste materials. We have employed a microbial fuel cell as a tool to capture electrons from the cellular respiration of the bacteria. The fuel cell works like a battery consisting of two halves, each half containing a conductive material which facilitates the transfer of electrons. The electrodes are also separated by a semi-permeable membrane. The anode interacts with the bacteria while the cathode is exposed to oxygen from the atmosphere. As bacteria interacts with the system, electrons will flow from the anode to the cathode, resulting in the production of electricity. Our first MFC design used a flex stack electrochemical cell, a commercial model which uses graphite plates as the anode and the cathode. The works of Oregon State University on microbial fuel cell basics, we were introduced to many different MFC designs, outlining their pros and cons and the variety of materials we could use to construct one. In testing this model with different resistors and concentrations, we recognized that we need to use a better MFC. The first version had a low threshold of power and the bolts would consistently loosen and leak bacteria leading to inconsistent results. Thus, we have created our own MFC design to improve upon these shortcomings. The new simplified system consisted of a plastic container with the carbon felt anode and cathode, which were separated using metal weights. However, the metal weights were increasing the voltage. Hence, we created a 3D printed apparatus to separate the two layers of carbon felt. The solution was found to be successful in testing. Throughout our prototyping efforts, we came to realize that the microbial fuel cells were sensitive to temperature change. When using liquid broth from the fridge, as it warmed up, it was clear that there was a difference in electricity generation. We adjusted our protocol by allowing the LB and bacteria to warm up to room temperature before running them in the fuel cell. Through this process of prototyping, we have been able to create an optimized system for testing the electricity generation of our bacteria and have prototyped our testing protocols to ensure consistent results. Thus far, we have tested liquid broth in our MFC, where we were able to generate a maximum of 0.56 milliwatts of power from 100 milliliters medium, enough to power small sensors, batteries, or capacitors. When scaling the size to 100 liter reactor, there would be enough to power phones and tablets. In the future, it is our aim to firstly gather data on how basic variables and constants such as temperature impact power generation. Next, we want to begin testing which strain of bacteria will generate the most power, as this will enable us to optimize our final system. In addition to our research, we have prioritized meaningful engagement with our stakeholders, prioritizing them in each of our actions. To better understand the real-world implementations of our project, we conducted a survey on 139 individuals to better understand stakeholders' knowledge and the problem of fabric waste. We were able to determine that 31.9% of respondents were not familiar with the term fast fashion. This indicates to us that one of the most important actions that we must take is to increase understanding of the problem. The most shocking realization we have is that 74.1% of individuals donate their clothing to charity. Only 1.4% actively throw their text. 
While our data demonstrates the heightening trends of donating textiles and allowing their lifespans to be prolonged, eventually these materials will still end up in landfills. Upon understanding these key facts about stakeholders, we have designed a short presentation aimed towards getting stakeholders involved in the discussion around fast fashion and fabric waste. By helping people uncover the truth, we can enable people to find a better solution through fab or fuel. We've also spent significant time reaching out to companies for feedback. Recently, we met with Shell and got input from them on how our project can be implemented in the real world, implementing circular design. Now, I'd like to ask you to think back to what we said at the beginning of the video. In the time that you have watched this video from start to finish, garbage trucks full of clothing have been landfilled or incinerated. And it is these textiles that are being released to affect our air, our water, our environment, and most importantly, they'll go on to affect lives of others across the globe. Judges, viewers, and participants, we are Fabrifuel, and it is our aim to find a solution to the ultimate problem of fabric waste. And we appreciate your help in turning an environmentally negative impact into a carbon negative and human positive solution. Fabrifuel, reducing waste, producing energy, all in a single solution.